John Mutcher, pastor at the Ferndale Alliance Church. And although our passage of Scripture today is Matthew 5, 16, I'd like to begin with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, words from a sermon that he preached Christmas Day in 1957. He asks, Why should we love our neighbors? The first reason is fairly obvious. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence. And toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. And... Unlike politicians and celebrities who have agents and press secretaries, publicists and directors of communica communications, who speaks for God? What is God saying right now? Who brings his message to us? Where is he during this pandemic? Where does he stand? Where is he during every every act of injustice from the death of George Floyd to every violent and destructive choice that have followed in the riots after that senseless and needless death, which are destroying billions of dollars in people's property. Imagine it was your property. Imagine everything you own and have right now, everything goes up in smoke and you're underinsured. And the killing of innocent people that is occurring over the last week and a half. Where does God stand and who speaks for God? And what does that message look like? Sure, there are preachers and so-called prophets and religious leaders, and they are saying different and sometimes contradictory things. God does not seem to have a publicist. He has somehow decided that he doesn't need one. Or does he? Does he have one? I think he does. And it is us, those that know him. So, let's listen to our verses today. Matthew 5, I'm going to read from verse 14 through 16 again. These are words that Dr. King was using in his sermon. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your, I'm going to leave it blank right there, that they may see your something and glorify your Father in heaven. What is it the world needs to see in order to bring its attention to a holy, just, and loving God? What is it? It's not our religion, as important as that might be. It's not our prayers. It's not our praise and our singing, which we're not able to do very much in corporate uh, community right now. It's not our church attendance, another thing we're not doing too much of lately. It's not the taking of communion or the going to confession. It's not baptism or tithing or memorizing and being able to recite the whole Bible. It's certainly not witnessing and sharing Jesus. These are all good things, and they all have their place. But what will glorify our Father in heaven and bring reverent, respectful, trustful attention to him? Well, let's read our passage again where we find the answer. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds or good works and glorifying, or that is, bring reverent and truthful attention to your Father in heaven. As important as it is, it is not religion, per se, that wins people to religion, to faith, to God. It's activities, good deeds, generated and fueled by sincere love and concern. Jesus says, in John chapter 13, this is how they will know that you are my followers, by their love. Now, there's a lot of phony service, a lot of phony volunteerism that's motivated by ulterior motives 
for show, to impress, to promote a career or some standing. I mean, let's face it, this is what politicians do, and I have some experience there. People will show up if there are cameras and if there are a crowd. And I got to tell you that people outside the faith are really good detectors of insincere love, hypocrisy, and services just for show. And let's face it, there are two types of good works. Those that are motivated by sincere love and those motivated by personal advancement or benefit. How do you know? How do you know the love that you have? Is it sincere or selfish? I think we know. I think it's the ability to do things quietly and unseen and privately uh, without fanfare, without fanfare recognition that shows the sincerity of our love. And the funny thing is, it's a little bit of a contradiction. I think we ought to endeavor to do things privately and secretly, and secretly without show, uh, which we think would be sort of a high, sort of a contradiction, because we want people to see it and glorify our Father in heaven. I think that is where we trust God, trusting that God will make apparent the works of service that we've done. Now, when we talk about works of service, uh, works of love. Some might say, Pastor, are you preaching salvation by works? That you could earn God's favor, earn God's salvation by your acts of work? Absolutely not. Scriptures are very clear that we're saved by grace through faith. But let me read the key passage that teaches us this. It's from, it's from Ephesians 2, verse 8, 9, and 10. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Then it goes on, by the way, all it says is that we are saved by grace through faith. It's not something we can possibly earn. We can't add up the good things we've done and tell God, now you have to let me into heaven because I've been a good person. I've done some good things. Absolutely not. It's entirely grace because of what he's done through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. But it goes on in verse 10 and, and says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So the good deeds come, but they always come from faith and trust, not before faith and trust. Now I'm reminded uh, that this series is probably watched mostly by Christians. So if we want to be light during this pandemic, during this time of protest and riots, I'd like to give some suggestions. Some suggestions of some easy but I think important good deeds. Number one, be the best listener in the room. Listen to what I just said. Be the best listener in the room. And it's hard because if you're like me, you have some strong feelings about God and about faith and about politics and about current events. And I take those things very seriously. Of course I do. But right now I'm trying to be a 90% listener. 90% listening. And maybe maybe 10% speaking, only if I think that a person is open to what I have to say. Number two, let's use our cell phones, our tablets, our computers for good, not for evil, not for division. I see a lot of people spouting off unintelligent, single-sourced, factless, thoughtless, caustic, divisive, inflammatory, and unoriginal dribble that does nothing to solve a problem or bring about improvement and positive change. Rather, it's just meeting a cathartic need to be outraged and angry. It's hard not to miss it. It's happening everywhere. Rather, right now, I see a contest to see who can be the most angry, the most outraged, and the most activist. And by the way, we're looking for voices of peace, reason, truth, right and righteousness, too many people just want to spew outrage. Too many people want to be an activist. I'm reminded, <laughs> Jesus says, blessed are not the activists. Jesus didn't say blessed are the activists. Jesus said blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. We need people that are active, actively making things better less arrogance, less meanness, less certainty. And so I like to encourage everybody to take a careful look at what you write. Um, trust me, some of it's quite shocking. 
I want you to imagine a time capsule. Everything that you've written or said recently regarding these um, horrific events in our country. Imagine them put in a time capsule, a time capsule that's saved and, that, and your grandchildren will get to read them. Are, you, are they going to be pleased with your words or not? Yes, speak out. Absolutely speak out. <laughs> Absolutely. But do it in a tone, in a method, and a sense of truth and accuracy that you can be proud of years from now. Number three, can I suggest that in the next few days, over the weekend perhaps, call four people. Call four people. Call two that are in the family of faith, that are part of your faith, part of your religion, and see how they are doing. We have been cut off and isolated, but thank God, thank modern technology that we have communication devices that we can reach out to people. I suspect there are two people that are, that are reasonably close to you, that mean something to you. Maybe family members, maybe church members that would be so blessed and so overjoyed to hear from you. Pick up the phone in the next couple of days and call them. Similarly, choose two people who are not necessarily part of your faith community, your church, your religious worldview, people that are outside your faith, that believe something completely different, people that are not of the same political party as you. Call them, let them know you're thinking about them, how are they doing, how are they processing all this turmoil that's going on, and let them know that you care for them. And finally, I know it's hard to volunteer right now, with all the COVID-19 limitations. But in your neighborhood, your cul-de-sac, find out what the needs are. Ask around a little bit. See how people are doing. Maybe they just need an errand run or a trip to the dump or just groceries purchased for them. Look for those that maybe you've, you've just not noticed before. Can I suggest this out of faith? Out of faith, ask God to show you people who need your touch I mean that metaphorically. We're not touching people these days. It need your attention, need your love, and see if you can help me. You might not be like the people down in Bellevue and Seattle and King County who are going to the cities that have been rocked with violence and, and cleaning up and, and, and picking up glass and things like that. But there are acts of servants. There are good deeds that you can do for other people right here in our own community if you just look around and just ask. So my main point today is this. It's not your religion that will win people to trusting God. It's your light, your salt, your humbly living the truth, and your good deeds born out of genuine and sincere love. So let's go be lights. It's a dark time right now. Dr. King challenges us to be light in darkness. So go be lights. And thank you for listening.